this right here. Good morning. We've been blessed with another beautiful Sunday morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Splendor and honor and royal power are yours by right, O God Most High. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being and yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation a royal priesthood to serve our God. And so to the one who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor forever and forevermore. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. Can you hear me? Yeah. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, says the Lord, Your wife shall become a prostitute in the city. And your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read some of God's. How long will you judge unjustly 
and show favor to the wicked. Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods and all of you children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our, fellow, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand if you're able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer to do this, you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell in the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and he saw him. He passed on the other side, so, like, so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling near, near him, when he saw him, he was moved with pity. 
he went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Our gospel this morning is really a story within a story. In other words, there is a frame that surrounds this well-known parable of the Good Samaritan. This is a parable that is so well known that you probably think there's nothing else you need to know about it. It's a parable so well known that the term Good Samaritan has been applied to an international charity, a travel and camping club, and a person, not a doctor, who uh, comes to save a life. The picture that this parable offers can stand alone, certainly, as an illustration of neighborly compassion versus cruel indifference. But this picture has a frame, and the frame does what any good frame should. It holds the picture in place and sets it off from the background. The frame makes the image stand out so that we can appreciate it all the more. And the frame is this. Questions posed by a lawyer, that is a religion scholar, and Jesus responses. That's our starting point. The lawyer engaging in a back and forth colloquy asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or stated another way, what must a person do to receive a God-filled, abundant life, life that is more than mere existence? And I should note that the lawyer was not asking Jesus, how do I get to heaven? That's not the question at all. And Jesus, who is completely at home in this kind of give and take, responds with questions intended to draw out answers, like any good teacher. He says, what is written in the law and how do you interpret it? The lawyer gives us the correct response, as you heard. This is the Shema, or declaration of faith, that is the essence of Judaism, that is said by devout Jews in the morning and in the evening as part of their prayers. And to this, Jesus responds, good, good, you've got the answer. Go and do. Now, you know, some commentators find the lawyer's questions self-serving, that he was showing off. And I don't. I don't. The business of religion scholars, such as this lawyer, was to sort through the application of the law to facts and circumstances. That's always been the work of lawyers and judges. So which of the 613 laws of the written Torah, after taking into account the two great commandments to love the Lord and love your neighbor, and the 10 commandments given at Sinai, which of those takes priority in a particular circumstance? And what about the unwritten Torah, that sort of um, law of custom? As a lawyer myself, I find nothing offensive in the give and take of applying law to facts. It's what we do. 
So why shouldn't the lawyer ask a follow-up question? And who is my neighbor? Now that's your frame. Let's look at the picture. An unnamed man journeys down the Jericho Road and he is ambushed, beaten unconscious, stripped of his possessions, even his clothes, and he's left for dead. That's all we know about him. The way to Jericho had a reputation as a dangerous road, but it was unavoidable. It was the way merchants got into Jerusalem. It was the way people who worked in Jerusalem in the temple returned to their homes in Jericho. It's where the elites had their uh, sort of um, winter homes down in Jericho. It's the road the Roman army used. Over a distance of 18 miles, a traveler on the way to Jericho from Jerusalem descends more than half a mile in elevation. The road runs down ravines with steep sides and turnouts, and it's a perfect place for bandits to hide and strike their victims. And on that day, the road lived up to its reputation. Now comes along a priest, possibly returning home to Jericho after serving his time in the temple in Jerusalem. He sees the injured man, and he crosses to the other side of the road to avoid him. Then comes a Levite. Levites were members of the tribe of Levi, and they had various duties associated with the temple, such as performing music, assisting with worship, standing guard, and so on. He, too, crosses over to the other side of the road. That's really heartless, you think to yourself. Why didn't they stop and help? Well, all sorts of reasons come to mind. They needed to get home before sunset. Maybe the man only appeared to be injured and he was really a decoy. Bandits were waiting to pounce. Perhaps the man was dead. And it would be best not to find out because to touch a corpse would render the priest and the Levite unclean. And that's important for us to recognize. Contact with a corpse is the most severe type of uncleanness in the ritual uh, purity laws of Israel, and it's contagious. If the injured man were in fact dead, and the priest or the Levite touched him, they would carry the uncleanness home, and then they and their families and their whole household would need to go to a lot of trouble and expense to purify themselves. Now, by the way, the public roads in Israel were assumed to be clean of corpse defilement, unless the traveler knew for certain he had touched human remains. That probably explains why the priest and the Levite crossed to the other side of the road. The priest and the Levite, in a matter of seconds, weighed their own interests against those of the bloodied and naked man and decided to keep their distance. And that's a cruel sort of indifference to suffering. So that's a lengthy explanation, but it helps us understand the reason for the dialogue between the lawyer and Jesus. Because it wasn't a light thing. It was a reasonable question. Because where Elsewhere in the Law of Moses, specifically in Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 16, it says, Do not stand idle by the blood of your neighbor. That verse has been interpreted in Jewish tradition to mean that if one sees another person whose life is in danger, you are obligated to save him or her. And the rabbis have added that if you cannot rescue the person yourself, you are obligated to call for help so others can do so. This verse has become so important that Jews and Christians alike have used it um, as a cry against gun violence. That we must not stand idle by the blood of our neighbor. So, what is more important? to avoid touching a corpse, or to save a life. And moreover, whose life? Hence the lawyer's follow-up question. 
the question of who is my neighbor has not always been so clear. It's not very clear to all of us today either. The priest and the Levite who crossed to the other side of the road might have considered the injunction to rescue the injured man. But what if he was not their neighbor? What if he was not even a fellow Jew? And because this man has been stripped of his clothes and possessions, and he's lying there on the road nearly naked, there was no obvious indication of who and what he was without a closer inspection, and they weren't going to get that close. Now along comes a despised foreigner, the Samaritan. And if you were in church a couple weeks ago, you heard that the disciples James and John were ready to call down thunder on the Samaritans for refusing to welcome Jesus as he passed through their country. So it's kind of ironic that Jesus points out the Samaritan. The Samaritan's heart goes out to the naked and half-dead victim. Here he is, the despised foreigner, who has oil and wine enough to salve the man's wounds, strength enough to lift the man onto his mule, time enough to take him to an inn, money enough to pay for his lodging, and enough generosity to pledge further payment if needed. And he demands nothing, nothing in return. It was not until this past week that I learned that the Torah the first five books of the Bible, the law, was the sacred text of the Samaritan community too. I didn't know that. I didn't even know that there is in fact a Samaritan community still living in the Holy Land. The Samaritan community followed the same rules regarding ritual purity as the Jewish community. The Samaritan also could, or maybe should, have avoided the injured man. It seems, however, that the Good Samaritan had a different set of priorities than the priest or the Levite. The scorned Samaritan, the other, is the neighbor to the victim. And so the victim, whoever he is, becomes the neighbor to the Samaritan. But look, the neighborhood relationship, this neighborliness, is not reciprocal. Neighborliness doesn't depend on reciprocity. In other words, if you invite me to your dinner party, I must feel obligated to invite you the next time I have a dinner party. That's reciprocal neighborliness, but that's not true neighborliness. True neighborliness isn't a social convention. Instead, it expects nothing in return because true neighborliness, the sort that Jesus spoke of, is true compassion. Remember that the victim who fell among robbers could not repay the Good Samaritan. Jesus completes the frame around the parable with this pointed question. Which of these three men was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer knows that he can't quibble any longer. There's just one response to Jesus' question. The one who showed him mercy. Jesus now takes the last word as he should. Go and do the same. That is the framework for an abundant life, everlasting life. Now, I once heard a preacher say that a parable is an answer to a question that you didn't know you ought to ask. But let me ask you, where do you find yourself in today's parable? I often find it useful when I'm reading scripture to put myself into the story and look at it from different points of view. We've looked at the priest and the Levite and considered their behavior. We've touched on the Good Samaritan who lived under the same biblical law of Moses as the priest and the Levite, but had different priorities. I'm fairly confident that we would like to identify with the Good Samaritan. He's the good guy. But tell me how many times have you walked past a person who appeared to be in trouble and thought to yourself, I can't manage this. I'm late getting home. This person looks very sketchy. I might get hurt. I might be sued. 
This is someone else's problem. This is why we elect public officials. This is why we have charitable organizations. Someone else will surely see this poor wretched soul and help. I've walked right past someone in need. I was a young woman living in New York, working in New York, and I was out at lunchtime with a colleague from my office, and we walked right past a man in Midtown who was lying face down in the street. She was a nurse by training. I said, you could do something. She said, I don't think so. And we walked on to lunch. On our return, he was gone. Someone came and helped that man. But it wasn't me. Should I? It's too late now. Maybe you've done something similar. Fear plays a part in those decisions. Self-preservation plays a part. And we, too, practice the same kind of studied indifference as the Levite and the priest. What are our priorities? Now, how about the victim lying in the road? Do we have anything in common with that voiceless and nameless person? I think so, and more than we might believe. When that traveler left Jerusalem and headed down the Jericho Road, he was likely making a familiar day's journey, thinking his familiar thoughts, confident he would arrive at his destination that evening. He surely had some possessions on his person and clothes that indicated some prosperity, enough to make him an attractive target for highway robbers. Possessions, nice clothes, a certain destination. None of that could protect this traveler from the unpredictable perils of his journey. What can protect any of us from inexplicable harms and unexpected evils that strike? Aren't there times when maybe spiritually, if not physically or economically, we are beaten down by circumstances? I think so. And who will come to our rescue on our own Jericho Road? People we hope or expect will respond to our needs might rather not see our pain. But there is someone who sees and rescues, binds up our injuries and promises to do even more if we are still in need. And Jesus is that one whose heart, the very heart of God, goes out to us in our distress. His example of a boundary-less compassion, true compassion, should change our priorities. His priorities compel us to risk our own well-being, to spend our own resources, to promise to do more if we can, and certainly to do so without making distinctions and without expecting anything in return. Now, there's a saying attributed to John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, which sums up very nicely the framework, the frame of an abundant life, a spirit-filled life that exceeds mere existence. And here is what Wesley said. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can as long as ever you can. Go and do likewise. If you are able, please stand. And let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, William, our bishop, Megan, and Ali, your priest, Basu, our deacon, and for all who serve God in the church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Joseph, our president, Philip, our governor, for all persons in positions of authority and public trust, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for prisoners, for the unemployed and the destitute, for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and the infirm, for the sick and suffering, and for those who have asked our prayers, including Joyce, Patsy, Carol, Janine, Patricia, Vibart, Barbara, Bruce, Carol, Barbara, Herb, Mildred, Valerie, Marianne, Robert, Tom, Hibbert, Sean, Taylor, Ralph, Yvonne, Pat, Bobby, the Zesky family, and Jacob. We pray also for Pastor Ali and the staff and patients of Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, for John and staff and patients of Uncline Forensic Center, and for those we now name. For Tim and Judy, Maureen and Steve. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our families and friends and those whose lives are linked with ours, especially those celebrating birthdays today, this week, including Tian, Victoria, Vance, and anniversaries including Joe and Sarah Zeski. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Luke, and of all your saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To, to you, you, O Lord, Lord our God. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us. 
the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also you. Please greet one another. Good morning. It's lovely to have you here today on this beautiful July morning. Kind of wish it would rain, but you know, I'll take what we have today. I want to thank our gardeners. Um, if you've noticed, our garden is now just taken off. Uh, the beans are coming up. We've uh, harvested greens, which Meg and Stuart have delivered to Trenton Area Soup Kitchen. Uh, zucchini are coming in. Uh, the little tiny cherry tomatoes are just little green balls right now, but they'll be ripening up very soon. So good work, gardeners. Um, I also want to let you know we held our first grill and gospel. You can sit down. You don't have to stand. You can sit down. We had our first grill and gospel on Wednesday evening with members of Grace St. Paul's Church, and it was a lot of fun. It was so nice to be back together after a two-year hiatus to have a little informal Bible study play sort of fun Bible game and just uh, have fellowship and more food than you can shake a stick at, of course. Um, and we will we'll do it again for the coming Wednesdays in July from 6 to about 8 o'clock. So join us if you can. Bring a little something for a side dish if you'd like to or for dessert. Uh, we still need one more person or perhaps, no? Oh. Vasu says that our list of home front children who need back to school clothes has been fulfilled. Thank you to everyone who's done that. We'll be delivering the clothes to home front in mid August, so please do bring them in uh, before that time. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings and come into his courts. If you are able, please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Luke, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the blessing of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, be with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.